Healthcare is rapidly changing with emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence revolutionizing diagnosis, treatment and care for patients and healthcare professionals. I have with me today Indian born cardiologist and Harvard professor Jag Singh who in his book Future Care explores exactly that idea, the rapidly evolving landscape of healthcare. Through a blend of research, analysis and real life examples, Singh delves into the idea of how the future of care will be virtual, sensor aided and digitally enabled, powered by predictive analytics. Dr. Singh, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Dr. Singh, thank you very much for joining in your book, Future Care, which I have with me here. It basically talks about sensors, artificial intelligence and the reinvention of medicine. Just walk us through a brief in terms of when you started writing the book and the crux of it. Absolutely. Um, so I was interested in the sensor arena somewhere around 2005, 2006 is when I got interested in it and started actively doing research work in about 2009. Um, I knew that this was the way care was going to evolve. Um, however, I think it was around 2015, 2016, when I realized that the way we actually deliver care in the hospital, at least in the United States, was not very efficient, uh, was not very equitable. Um, and I felt that the integration of sensor-based strategies with remote monitoring could potentially change the way we manage patients. Um, so I started writing this actually a month before, sorry, a year before COVID, and it got catalyzed by the whole COVID process uh, because I think uh, suddenly there was this burgeoning uh, era of digital care that we were delivering during COVID because we were all trying to stay distanced from, from hospitals. So, so it really manifest uh, slightly before COVID, but I, I wrote it during the COVID period. Okay, but explain the idea of healthcare being virtual as well as sensor aided. So virtual means that patients can get care anywhere, wherever they are, from any doctor, anywhere in the world ideally, but anywhere in the country, for sure. Um, so some of that we already understand through the proposition of telehealth and telemedicine. Now, when you see a patient virtually through telehealth, um, you're really not examining the patient. So it's kind of a sophisticated telephone call. But if you want to make that visit more objective, that's where you have sensor-based approaches that can make it more objective, so you can have vital statistics such as temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, even chest lung sounds and heart sounds can now be sensor driven data that a clinician can get. So if you want to make a virtual visit really objective, having sensor driven data actually enhances that clinical visit. Okay, so just give us a sense in terms of how exactly is this going to change the way we receive as well as deliver healthcare? Absolutely. So I think uh, receiving care uh, would be probably the way to start first. I think patients um, who don't want to come into the hospital, so let's take a patient of heart failure who, you know, coming into the hospital is, a, is quite the journey, finding their way, mm -hmm. parking, driving, finding, uh, you know, their way into the hospital crevices to meet their clinician, which can be an, uh, you know, an experience that actually may worsen their heart failure. So I think many of those instances, those patients can actually be followed from afar because a lot of the parameters of heart failure can now be digitized mm -hmm. uh, and can be actually measured through sensor-based approaches that can allow that patient to be followed from a distance and managed from a distance. So that information from the heart failure patient can come to the clinician you have enough objective parameters as to decide how you're gonna treat that patient and you can deliver the care remotely to those patients. So there are many other nuances to this, but I think looking at it from the balcony, this is kind of the most perfunctory way of explaining it. Okay, but uh, what I'm sensing is that a lot of this is probably to do with chronic care? Absolutely, so you know, if you look at why healthcare is non-sustainable right now, it's because Chronic care is eating away at the national exchequer. At least in the United States, three of every four dollars are spent in looking after patients with chronic disease. So, so I think, you know, if you look at the chronic diseases, and this is for the audience, I mean, give you an example of it is diabetes, hypertension, chronic obstructive lung disease, mm -hmm. heart failure, you know, the four big ones out, out here are all chronic diseases. 
And, and many of these chronic diseases now can be managed with sensors from a distance. Mm -hmm. So you can actually reduce the cost of it potentially in the future. So, so I, I do feel that if we want to really make headway mm -hmm. into reducing the amount of expenditure on healthcare, chronic diseases is the way to go and creating digital pathways in managing each one of these chronic diseases is the future. Do you believe every organ can be digitized? Oh, absolutely, 100%. Maybe not right now immediately, but there are efforts going on to actually digitize every organ. Currently, in the current scenario that we're in, which are the organs which are probably most digitized at this point in time? For example, where exactly is AI being used most effectively in healthcare? Absolutely, so being a cardiologist, that's my comfort zone. I can tell you that, you know, uh, in the cardiovascular space, you can get information about every electrical signal from the heart. Uh, you can get information about heart rate, blood pressure, um, you know, cardiac output, con cardiac contractility. So there are several parameters that are already available for the heart. The lungs, again, can be digitized. You can get information regarding voice. The voice itself can be digitized. And by looking at, there are certain apps that actually hearing the voice using AI-based strategies can diagnose whether patients have tuberculosis or whether they're going into heart failure. These are low-cost options for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides that, you know, there are digital signals now that can help assess what the respir respiratory tidal volume is, what the respiratory excursion is. So if you look at every organ system, there are ways that they can potentially be digitized and this information can be then hopefully integrated into what I just said, the digital dashboard. Okay, your book is peppered with real life examples. Uh, give us one example where AI or digitization in health has been used effectively. So, so the book is, uh, as you said, uh, made up of patient stories. And I think that makes it special because it touches on real life examples that allow us to understand where healthcare is now and where it potentially can be. Um, one of the uh, you know, stories, uh, so there are many stories, and I could say something as simple. Uh, so I was looking after a CEO of a, of a company who actually, this is a really simple example. I'm not going to get into the AI aspect with this example, but you know, a, a patient had a, a heart rate which was always in the 55, 60 range, and he noticed that his heart rate now was about 70. Now, if you went to a normal clinician and said, my heart rate 70, you would say that's a normal heart rate, so you don't really have to do anything about it. But this patient had been tracking his heart rate and noticed that there was a slight change, well within the normal range, but using his personal data, there was an increase in the heart rate. So one of the things as a cardiologist I thought is maybe he's developing some signs of heart failure or there's some element of decompensation, that's why his heart rate's gone up. So I obviously did an echocardiogram uh, to look at his heart function and found, lo and behold, that he had actually developed a cardiomyopathy and had developed heart failure very early in the stages. But it shows you that some of these digitized signals, as simple as heart rate, in a patient with continuous tracking or continuous surveillance can allow us to actually not only predict but monitor patients and potentially also avert disease. <laughs> From an Indian setting, how exactly can digital healthcare be utilized effectively? Absolutely. That's uh, a question that's very close to my heart. I, you know, I, I believe in the phrase that digital inequity will lead to health inequity. Mm. So I think uh, you know, one of the, um, the, the underlying thesis for this book was how can we make uh, health equitable across the world? And I think right now, just to kind of take a step back, the fact that we have you know, ubiquitous data. We have unlimited connectivity now with massive processing power. I think we have the opportunity of actually making digital health equitable mm. and health equity also across the, across the world. Now, you know, there are many aspects of things that can serve as barriers. And I think the first thing in India that we really need to do is enhance the awareness, enhance the acceptability, and then obviously enhance the accessibility and affordability of a, of, a, of a solution out here. If you look at the availability of smartphones across the country, I think about 75 to 80% of folks in India, adults, have smartphones. 
So just having smartphones enhances the ability of actually using sensor-based approaches and AI-based approaches and making health equitable across a large section of India. So I think, um, I think we have the, certainly the intellectual power uh, that can innovate. Uh, and that innovation will lead to low-tech solutions, like we talked, for example, about just voice being a predictor of which patients are going to develop tuberculosis. So develop low-tech solutions that can then be potentially scalable across the country. So I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, uh, you know, with our intellectual power out here, we can certainly make it. But India has one of the highest out-of-pocket expenditures when it comes to health. It's reduced from the peak, but nonetheless, it's still high. Uh, so in that context, how much do you think digital healthcare could probably help in terms of reducing expenditure? You'll be amazed, but you know, I think in the next five years, the cost of making a diagnosis and putting into play the diagnostic pathway for a disease is going to really become minimal. Mm. Uh, and I think when that becomes the case, I think the health costs will come down, out-of-pocket costs will come down, I think the issue always will be is the delivery of care is expensive. Mm. And I think if we can invest through these digital solutions in wellness and reduce chronic disease that we talked about, then our need for complicated care and specialty care is actually going to get minimized. Mm. And I think through these digital strategies, we have an opportunity actually to reduce disease and chronic disease and actually reduce the need for patients to actually seek complicated care. Would that work in a context of, say, preventive care when it comes to cancer as well? Absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, so, so at Mass General, we have this new algorithm, for example, which is called Sybil, that looks at low-dose CT and can see patients with have pulmonary nodules that are labeled to be normal. But using AI, you can actually predict which of those nodules is going to become cancerous in one to six years, mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes, they're labeled as normal. So I think AI-based approaches will help us predict and prevent disease, and I think take away some of that cost from within the system. Well, the other factor about, you know, maybe artificial intelligence and digitization of healthcare is the data deluge. How do you make sense of the amount of data that you collect? Uh, how does artificial intelligence help in that aspect? Is that a challenge? Right. So, so that's a really good question again. So I, you know, there's a lovely saying by Daniel Kimoran's that you can have data without information, but you can't have information without data. Mm. Uh, so it's so important for us to recognize that we need the data, and we need to be able to sift through the data. We need artificial intelligence to help collect the data, to help annotate the data, to help curate the data, to help analyze the data, and then give us the output that we can actually use to implement clinical care. Now, this can occur and has been occurring in smaller you know, situations, but I think it has to become scalable. Uh, and I think the part of the data deluge is to develop AI-based strategies that can help us parse through this data in a less cumbersome way. And I think that's where the whole role of uh, generative AI is gonna help us. Okay, well, one of the other challenges is, for example, the regulators probably trying to uh, regulate artificial intelligence in healthcare. For example, the US FDA has indicated that they don't have resources needed to preside over technology which is rapidly changing. So how do both those lines work and move in parallel? It's so important to have the appropriate constraints uh, because you have a lot of bad actors and nefarious activity can potentially happen, especially in the artificial intelligence space. Um, I, I think you know, those are good points. I think uh, we have to have regulatory forces, but at the same time, we need to know that the data sets we're using for artificial intelligence are representative of every patient we're actually using them for. So you can develop an algorithm in the US, but you may not be able to use it in India because it's not representative of the population that you're actually using it for. So I think data set generalizability is really important. Beyond that, I think, there is so much of importance that needs to be given to transparency, to uh, traceability, to know where the data has actually come from, and then the security and privacy constraints mm. are really important. So I think as much as regulatory constraints can stifle innovation, I think it's important because they have to create the guardrails, otherwise this can go beyond control. 
Okay. All right. Uh, well, that point is taken. Uh, on a larger context, uh, Dr. Singh, you know, are we talking about possibly a person in India or in China or in another country getting treated by a doctor, say, in the U.S., maybe surgeries being done effectively or virtually? Is that where we're probably headed? You know, I think much of the change we see are going to be driven by patient expectations, mm. by physician will willingness, the combination of the two, uh, and visionary leadership. I think all of those things really are, are the three pillars of we can bring about change. But I think what you say is absolutely right. I think we have to get out of this mold of living in our silos. There's this whole concept of networkness where you can get care from whomever you want, wherever you are, from whichever doctor, for whatever disease you have. So I can envisage a time, not in the distant future, within the next five to 10 years, uh, with the adequate disclaimers uh, that I will be able to see a patient in Thailand where I will have sensor-driven data from that patient that I can actually see objectively. I can have access to that patient's um, records in Thai that can be translated by generative AI and summarized mm -hmm. and sent across to me and in a live single one-way two-way conversation using that data using sensor driven data and the potential use of AI also in these situations I could provide care to that patient and I can see that happening uh, not in the too distant future I think the regulatory issues will eventually be overcome and I think they will be overcome by patient expectations in the future but will digitization and artificial intelligence probably overtake the human touch? Will diagnosis probably just be linked to AI eventually because of just the accuracy and surgeries? So, so I think there's always the fear. Uh, the more you depend on a technology mm -hmm. and the less you use your own cognitive skills, you lose those cognitive mm -hmm. skills. Um, there is also the fear that you become so dependent on this black box that it can actually dictate how you actually practice medicine. I think, I think it is incumbent on us mm. as clinicians, as you know, uh, regulatory bodies, uh, as patients, that we have to preserve the human touch. There's a lovely saying by you know, Francis Peabody who says that the secret of the care of the patient lies in caring for the patient. Mm. And I think it is so imperative that we actually preserve the human touch. We temper the technology in such a way that the digital pathways we create are a construct that bring, bring together this digital and human touch and really change the paradigm of care in the future. Okay. All right, uh, Dr. Singh, before we wrap up, since you have given so many examples, leave us with a hypothetical example that if in case there is more penetration of artificial intelligence as well as digitization in healthcare, what would be a possible example of a patient uh, in terms of treatment, say, five years down the line? So, you know, I think the power of AI uh, lies in prevention, mm. lies in prediction, um, and lies in not only forecasting the disease, but uh, averting disease. And I think if we have AI-based approaches that can allow us to individually determine which patients are going to develop diabetes, hypertension, or hyperlipidemia, and we can prevent those conditions, which we know we can. Mm. We know they're all preventable. Many of these diseases are lifestyle diseases. I think using sensors and AI-based approaches along with preventative strategies, you can prevent these diseases from happening, which is called primordial prevention, or you can prevent these diseases from progressing. Mm. And if you can prevent these diseases from progressing, you can actually prevent coronary artery disease and heart attacks and sudden cardiac death so I'm uh, an optimist. Um, I, I would say that uh, I, I think uh, I, I would call myself a hope purveyor uh, that the possibility of actually preventing uh, disease and sudden cardiac arrest and limiting the incidence where patients need hospitalization will significantly get, uh, I would say, reduced with the use of this technology. All right, Dr. Singh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining in and uh, looking forward to seeing more developments in digitization and healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it.